So my name is Megan. Um, I am one of the organizers for this competition. I'm from um, Yale, Yale School of Architecture. And there are my two teammates. Hi, I'm, I'm Jagan from Columbia University. It's very exciting to have uh, Jaffer and Emmet, my previous professors, studio professors here. Yeah, it's very exciting to hear you guys. Yeah. It's good to see, good to see you on Zoom. Hi, I'm Pauling. I'm from Yale as well. And yeah, I'm glad to have our jurors today here to share with us their thoughts about some of the questions that we're interested in. And we hope everyone will enjoy this as well. All right. Okay. Would Jaffer and I met you to maybe introduce yourself like very briefly um, and like your major interest at the moment, maybe, or project? Uh, sure. Um, so my name is Emmett Zeifman. I teach at uh, Columbia, as uh, Jagan mentioned, and uh, I have an office called Medium Office. Um, and I would say maybe right now, which I think is relevant also to this conversation in, in the studio at Columbia, we're thinking about the kind of afterlife of the architecture of the service economy. So stores, restaurants, offices, uh, things which are currently vacant and may remain that way for an extended period of time. Um, for reasons beyond coronavirus. So that that's a, a current interest. Hey, thank you. Um, my name is Joffre Kolb. Uh, I teach between Columbia, I'm currently actually teaching at Yale, and uh, have an office called New Affiliates, which I started uh, with a partner back in 2016. Uh, funnily, we also are interested in afterlives, although maybe slightly differently um, than Emmett. Uh, we do a lot of work in uh, reuse, looking at the kind of byproducts of the discipline of architecture and, and how we practice and figuring out new ways to kind of instrumentalize them um, through public work mostly. Great, thank you. So thank you to you again for joining us and for um, agreeing to act as yours to this competition. And as both of you are familiar with, um, so the brief, so the format of our competition is quite un unconventional in the way that we're looking to um, generate ideas by matching um, physical infrastructure with like non-physical activities that are maybe not conventionally associated together. So as a like a first exercise or like an icebreaker, um, we want to see if, um, we want to ask you the question, like if you were actually doing this competition as a participant, what sort of set of keywords would you two be interested in picking that you, you feel like excited and challenged by? So we pick one on the well, left and one on the right? Yeah. And then to create like a design, like alternative design of how they could work together to, you know, to promote a, like health and wellness in society overall. Uh, I feel very uh, confident in what I would pick on the physical infrastructure side. The health activities is much harder. <laughs> Yeah, I'll say I always go for the most boring uh, set of words. I would probably stay away from the ones that seem exciting because I don't know, I find it more more compelling to take on boring problems. So <laughs> my first thought would be to go to something like public plazas on the physical infrastructure, which I realize is probably the least, least exciting. You guys probably were like, oh, I guess we have to throw that one in there. Um, but I think I'd go for that. And I also am trying to figure out health activities. Yeah, I would be uh, shopping malls or parking, probably. Mm. Especially parking structures, uh, if those are an option in the, in the surface and underground parking. But yeah, in the health activity, I don't know. I, I think, I mean, maybe what I would be most interested in, which isn't exactly one of these activities, but rolls them up together, would be, generally speaking, at the moment, the uh, lack of capacity that exists in the places that we live, like in our residences, to mm -hmm. handle the number of things that we're trying to do. And so thinking about kind of extending the home uh, into other spaces uh, in order to accommodate also living, working, education, childcare, everything mm -hmm. Simultaneously happening, happening, especially in a large city in a very small apartment. 
Okay, guys, I'm gonna go with public plazas and cleaning. Those are my two, <laughs> the two I find the most exciting. Um, I've maybe I've I would just, take like, cooking and dining. It what? I would maybe take cooking and dining. We can plaza? clean up after you, Emmett. <laughs> to work together perfectly. Yeah, I feel like I have a, an interest in, I mean, uh, yeah, for a lot of reasons, I have an interest in, in, in kind of like maintenance and preservation, which I kind of think I'll have a, a nice affinity with cleaning and also mm -hmm. thinking about like the kind of early 20th century, you know, at the advent of modernism, the idea of like the filleted corner being like more easily cleaned of seamlessness and all of these mm. kind of issues that sort of came up a um, hundred years ago now that had everything to do with like a public health crisis whose manifestation found itself in the kind of amelioration through like cleanliness. And I think cleanliness is like a, a kind of word that we often associate with oppression in certain ways, but also like liberation and others. And it, it feels like now is a moment where cleaning is something we're all really obsessed with, right? Like I only feel comfortable in places where I can, you know, not touch anything or touch <laughs> only things that I can like govern through like antiseptic wipes. I, there's like a whole kind of new language, um, yeah. I think there's something really interesting about cleaning. Also as like a public service and a public act. Um, I'm always interested when I go not to necessarily America, but other countries where like the kind of like street sweeping is this sort of like choreographed thing that happens that has a kind of know, beautiful aesthetic quality at the risk of sounding too fetishistic over labor. I mean, why dining? Why well, I think in the context of ordinary activities, you know, things that are not, uh, that have to take place every day in some fashion. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in that kind of, I, I think like you, I always stay away from the things that seem too exciting or uh, sort of distinct as actions or programs. And I'm attracted to those that are but somehow the problem, dealing with the problems of kind of mundane daily life, mm. one form or another. But in a potentially expanded fashion, in a reimagined fashion. Yeah, I mean, how do, I, it's maybe a, like, I guess maybe a question, this is more a question for you as the competition organizers, mm -hmm. is to, to what extent is the construction of the brief uh, meant to, reflect uh, sort of immediately on our present circumstances where the project uh, meant to somehow address the, the sort of immediate present of the pandemic or to what extent is it anticipatory or projecting something beyond the pandemic? I think both, both ways because we feel like there will be long lasting changes to the way people approach a lot of activities and physical spaces, some changes that might quickly, of course, revert back to the way they were, but there are things that I think uh, there are changes that are being implemented right now that we feel might last longer. For example, the readaption of like public street space for dining like, in New York. Right? And uh, the, there's a lot of changes that actually people, I find people enjoy uh, as a better way of living. <laughs> Rather, although they were so forced um, and semi-imposed because of this pandemic, but it, but this really offers us a chance to rethink, like what are there the, some other ways that we could start using these spaces, and what are some other fashions that we could um, act out these these activities. So that was um, part of like our motivation in in creating this particular brief. Yeah, maybe that's uh, instinctively, dining seems like something that's gotten better for the most part since the <laughs> pandemic. Either you're at home spending a lot, of more, lot more time cooking much better meals than you normally would, yeah. or you're out on the street eating in a way that was not, at least in New York, typically how one uh, lived in the city. And for the summer months, at least, that I think has been one of the sort of silver linings of this is to see New York as a very different kind of city. Um, 
in terms of the, the kind of social life of the street. And so maybe uh, that is another reason why I would take cooking and dining as something to work on beyond, to sort of extend through the pandemic and beyond it in a more kind of substantive transformation of how we collectively enjoy city life. Interesting, thank you. So now that, because we were surprised that, it's, it's very interesting how people have very different approaches because we almost expect or just at least our panels, panelists last time, they all went for like really unconventional um, pairings. And so, so, and they, they all looked for things that basically goes beyond the field of architecture. Whereas it's very interesting, both of you chose uh, activities and also spaces that are so sort of close to everyone that everyone feels like they have the expertise at least to to act in those fashions and to have like an intimate knowledge of them. Because we, like today we, the way that we have focused our, our conversation, at least what we uh, felt would be interesting to talk with both of you is the idea of research in architecture. It's when architecture outreaches itself, reaches out to other fields or disciplines. Like for example, with um, dining or even cleaning, there are, so, so when you design a street sweeping infrastructure or car, there are certain sort of expertise knowledge that goes into it. And we just um, were curious to what you think about like the position of an architect when, when you're actually designing beyond the scope of, for example, a single object, when you're designing infrastructures that obviously involve a lot more variables and parameters than what's immediate to build um, the built object or environment. So maybe um, an, a simpler question that we can start with is like, for example, what resources would you use to start? Like when you are given a project that, for example, taps into some other, um, some, some other activity or field of expertise. I think it depends so much on the project, right? Like, um, so I'll, I'll for a minute assume that you're talking about like a kind of larger infrastructural project, which <laughs> I will profess to have no immediate experience in as like a practitioner. I'm still working on the small stuff. Or um, it could be as small. So it could be like furniture, but the furniture yeah. design is like a field too, right? Yeah, no, for sure. And like, I, I was sort of thinking about something that you said in response to Emmett's last point, which was, you know, like, so you want to do a boring thing, right? But but of course you're going to reinvent it or expand it or something like this. Like it feels like you wanted to kind of insert like a kind of glory into even like the decision to choose a somewhat banal topic. And I, I wouldn't speak from it, but for myself, like I'm not even that interested in, in expansion or reinvention or like taking on a generic boring thing just so I can turn it on its head. In a lot of ways, I think that's like the fallacy of how architecture has been set up, particularly in the last 30 years, that like we're, we're sort of obligated. And, you know, I don't want to go off on a too much of a tangent, but I think it obviously has a lot to do with like cultures of late capitalism. But, you know, we're not, we're not able to just kind of work on something. We have to reinvent it. We have to write a manifesto about it. We have to do something totally new that you've never thought about. And, you know, like take the idea of cleaning and, and make it something that's like radical. And I, I really have an allergy to a lot of these, these words and these methodologies. And I think that there's like a lot that can be said for just like care and attention and actually trying to focus your interest on like, yeah, the history of a, of a so-called discipline, like the, let's say cleaning, for example, like I don't think that we need to come in and, and turn everything upside down. I think that that's like a very strange a manifestation of, of, of a culture of invention that has everything to do with trying to stake our claim on something, right? Like there's a kind of like a, an ownership to that. Um, so like when I start a project from a piece of furniture to like an imagined infrastructure, like 
I tend to like to go as deep as possible into that particular like history and discourse and like understand it. Um, but through kind of like practical means, like what's worked, what doesn't, like what voices are underrepresented and how you approach the issue, like who do you not talk to? Um, one of the heroes of our of our office is um, Meryl Laterman U. Kelly's, who you probably all know, um, but she was an artist who in the 1970s became deeply associated with the Department of Sanitation and in fact, since the 70s, has been the artist in residence, a, a kind of position she carved for herself. Um, but that her, her work in the 70s was so much about just like going into the street and relearning about sanitation, not to reinvent it, not to, to pee on it, to use a kind of bad metonym, but in fact, just to actually engage you know, for example, the sanitation workers or like the kind of infrastructure of sanitation. And she worked a lot between the, the DSNY and the DOT to really just understand and highlight aspects of it that are otherwise under-recognized or that like, you know, the quote unquote public or the average citizen has no idea about. So for me, it's, it's those like aspects um, that are more interesting than approaching a problem just to kind of like make something new or expand it. Yeah, I would second that very much. I think that's actually something we're working on in the studio right now because I think from the beginning, students, there's a kind of studio culture, which is always, uh, which is kind of expansive in its mindset. It's always trying to find something beyond architecture to work on at, I think, the expense sometimes of developing an expertise in architecture. Um, and I think there's also been a kind of inverse relationship between architects' desires to do more and more and their actual relevance in the built environment. And maybe that's beyond their control to some extent, and, or I don't know exactly what the causality is, but somehow it seems like uh, a more precise focus on where the architect really has agency mm -hmm. and where they can um, stake a claim in the, the, the kind of processes of shaping the built environment. Um, would be uh, appropriate at this moment. Because I think, especially in the academic context, we often spend a lot of time avoiding uh, talking about the more kind of mundane perhaps, but also I think more material, in the, in the literal sense, sort of material realities of, of architecture and, and what, an architecture, what an architect contributes um, to the process of, of, the, of, sort of constructing the built environment. Yeah, I don't know if you have this too, Emmett, but, and, and I'm not sure um, for the three of you who are organizing if mm -hmm. Latour is still like a big touchstone, but I remember like a decade ago, maybe even like 12 years ago, in architecture schools, we were all reading and talking about Latour uh, because there was an interest in the kind of like anthropology of practice. Like what does an architect do? What does practice look like? How is an office structured? How does research, it, it, how is that undertaken as a methodology? And I think like part of the reason that that was so popular, I'm just, this is like a really half-baked thought, so I'm probably going to regret saying it, but, you know, there was a kind of uh, a fixation on these issues because we had all, previous to that, been sort of forced always to look outside of the discipline, right? Like there was this real focus on extra disciplinarity, like what can we borrow from the post-structuralists? What can we borrow from the deconstructivists? What can we borrow from all of these other fields, like critical art theory, et cetera? Mm -hmm. I realize the irony is that I just brought up an artist as my, as my reference, but um, <laughs> I think that like the, perhaps where like, you know, our generation kind of turned a bit was to look a bit more inwardly. Like, you know, when you start to actually try and understand the anthropology of practice around architecture, what are we omitting by always looking out versus looking in to reestablish like methods of our own agency? So I think that is uh, probably shared between a lot of people around the same kind of um, age as Emmett and I, and like the this sort of interest comes from, I don't know, reestablishing a core, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was going to say, uh, I didn't have the Latour reference, but I think m more sort of uh, internal to the discipline, there's been a number of um, a number of ideas of architecture's core. I mean, that actually was an issue of the Harvard Design Magazine that had an essay by um, President Scott Cohen called the hidden core of architecture. But, you know, I think I think this 
question of returning to the actual material structure of architecture and what is uh, in his, I mean, I think his term is sort of semi-permanent, uh, like the, what the architect puts in place that provides a kind of material resistance it, it, in time to what, um, to potential sort of uses and reuses of spaces. I think that's been an, an idea that's very interesting to me and that we've been working on certainly in, in um, design studios, um, as Jay could attest probably um, from last semester. Um, but yeah, I think I, I'd echo the kind of generational interest. I, I think it also has to do with, this gets to one of the other questions that I think was sent in the email sort of floated, which is not having a kind of disdain for more ordinary projects, but finding um, ways both within your practice to develop through those projects and take them as opportunities um, to test at small scales and small budgets and it, you know in kind of collaboration with as opposed to kind of in resistance to your clients to test ideas and and figure out how to do things which is you know you're, you're always kind of learning on the fly probably at any stage in a practice but certainly if you start a practice um, relatively young and with relatively little experience um, preceding it in other offices, which is was certainly the case in our practice and jobs were probably similar in yours. So you sort of can't afford to like not do small projects because they're not quote unquote interesting because you actually have to learn how to do these things at a certain point. Um, but also to find in them, I think, a kind of agency and a, an ability to make uh, the small but I think important improvements to the built environment and, and help to um, shape spaces in, in ways that, I don't know, just like a little quirkier and more playful and more um, maybe tactile or, or materially um, exciting than they would otherwise be. And I, I think there's still a value in that, even if it's, you know, it's just a small residential interior or a small store or some of the things that I think previous generations um, even when they were doing them seemed to be, uh, there was a kind of posture of resistance towards that, um, that kind of work. And I think that extends to also more sort of mundane, larger scale projects, um, you know, which we have started to tackle like in school, you know, not thinking that you always, and this goes back to the first question, that the brief for the project has to combine two or three radically different things. I mean, when I was a graduate student, our first, couple semesters, you know, we would design a museum that was also a library, but it was in a park and it was also some kind of, you know, like there was always three or four pro programs being kind of intersected. There was some sort of OMA Dutch uh, kind of hangover, I think, happening where everything was uh, some kind of condenser of all of the, the kind of exciting new possibilities of culture at that moment. Um, and I think tackling more straightforward problems um, also offers an opportunity to, to think a little bit more rigorously maybe about um, how the architect intervenes in those, in those um, you know, basic kind of functions of society, like where people live, where people work, uh, you know, how people just get around um, in their daily lives. I always think of that moment as like typified by the, um, everything was always coupled with a shooting range. There was this period where it was just like, a shooting range in a mall, a shooting range in a homeless shelter, a shooting range in a spa. And it was just, like, oh my God, I can't. Uh, so frustrating. But it sounds like both of you would um, agree that you see expertise in architecture or architecture's unique value as a profession mm -hmm. to lie in it, like material, like in very physical changes to to shape society rather than um, things that are more systematic or policy or infrastructural that goes like, you know, beyond beyond the immediate physical realities around us. Um, would you I that? would actually totally disagree with that. Oh, really? Okay, <laughs> I so hope that's I hope that's not the impression that I'm giving. At least, mm -hmm. like, I absolutely think architectural expertise can exist in policy. I mean, I studied urban planning before I studied architecture, mm -hmm. and like. I deeply believe that we can do things that are that are immaterial, um, that are infrastructural, that are systemic, that are even philosophical, ideological, policy based. Um, I guess where I think um, where I think we do need to recognize the word expertise is a great one, and I think we need to recognize our own expertise. And our expertise doesn't have to be limited to to built 
matter. I mean, I think that probably both Emin and I like building things and that's fine, but I think that there's something equally valid in an architect who never builds anything at all. I think that the, for me, the trick is to understand that other disciplines also have expertise. Mm -hmm. And so while I like absolutely, you know, I talking about looking inward and like, you know, reshaping the core, blah, blah, blah. That's all very much true. But at the same time, I love collaborating. Like I collaborate with any expert that I can, you know, we're always working with like artists or the city, the department of parks, the department of sanitation, all these things. Um, but I think recognizing the limits of our expertise and where collaboration can then introduce extra disciplinarity is more interesting to me than what I perceive. And maybe this isn't true now. Um, I, you know, I, I'm a lot of what I'm talking about today is like things that I remember from being a student 10, 15 years ago. But I remember finding it so frustrating that architects seem to want to do everything themselves. Like I'm a filmmaker, I'm an animator, I'm a sculptor, I'm a designer, I do lighting, I do graphics, I do research, I do writing, I'm an, I'm an academic and all these things. And it, it seemed to me that that was a bit of a problem because we were looking outside of architecture as a discipline and trying to borrow bits and pieces almost like, um, uh, dilettantes from any field we could and then claiming our own expertise in them and I think that's what I at least have always rejected like I'm not and I'm also it's like a funny thing because I didn't study architecture before my master's like I came from film I did neuroscience I did all these other things and eventually I came to architecture like probably later on than a lot of people um, but I think that made me really aware, like, okay, why are all of these theoreticians, historians, and practitioners just like looking around and stealing bits and pieces from other people's fields, folding them into architecture, and then claiming like a, a discursive or rigorous uh, discipline around that? And so, I, yeah, I, I don't think this is about building material things, and that's all architects should do. But I think we could acknowledge or should acknowledge like the ways that we are taught to think certain ways by looking at our own histories and, um, and instrumentalize those for in through whatever means or methods. If you were to make a positive statement, what would you think is- That's an impossibility. I don't know how to- The positive, the positive is the expertise, or can you maybe define a boundary of that expertise if you can't really positively define that expertise itself? Maybe are there some boundaries, like effective boundaries that you think, or in your experience that you could feel, okay, this is where architecture stops and my collaborator starts to dance. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think where architects are, are uh, do the best work is in orchestrating other experts, right? Like we, uh, you know, I think at worst, we, we suffer dilettantism when we try and borrow those things and then work in isolation. But at best, I mean, think about the role of the architect on site, like we're coordinating, right? We coordinate between a structural engineer, a mechanical engineer, a contractor, the DOB, an expediter, a client. Like we are very good to position ourselves in the middle of things that have to do with like, built environment, space, cities, infrastructure systems, and to, to figure out how they can like work better. Whatever better means has everything to do with an individual's practice. Mm -hmm. But I think that you define the terms, and I do, I, I realize I'm a, I'm a <laughs> negational and critical thinker, but I do feel very optimistic about the field and the profession. But I think we're, we're, the best thing we can do is actually just talk to different experts, bring them into some kind of conversation around issues of like cities, built space, preservation, et cetera, um, and then create productive conversations out of those new comminglings. Thank you. I mean, is there anything you want to chime in on this topic? Yeah, sorry, I was just moving to some background noise. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I don't think there's a, there's a sort of fixed boundary or limit to our expertise, but I think it's, you know, I think embracing the, it's a relief to when you realize you don't have to invent everything and do everything yourself and become simultaneously a great filmmaker and a great architect and an expert in uh, social policy. I mean, I think recognizing that these things um, have, are their own fields where there are people who spend their entire lives working on these problems and that it's much more interesting to have a conversation with them or collaborate with them than to appropriate or attempt to appropriate um, their work as your own. I think it, it's like a, it's enormous burden that's lifted 
when you st when you stop worrying. Wait, I think I lost everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. We can still hear you. Okay. Yeah. So so I yeah I don't think I don't know that there's a specific um, boundary that I could identify, and I I I think it of it ex what architecture does of course extends beyond construction, but that is its sort of core is, is uh, you know, if you think about it both as a kind of social, the, 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 the institutional role of the architect in terms of, you know, your kind of legal responsibilities or, or your um, professional status, um, where architects have a specific agency that no other um, discipline has is in uh, the organization of material, the material of the built environment and uh, a kind of coordinating function uh, between other disciplines, engineering, construction, et cetera, in um, putting the kind of pieces of construction together. And so that seems to me like a kind of core from which you can expand outward, um, but not that you have to constantly expand outward or disdain that and be in search of something uh, that's an alternative to it. So I don't know where the kind of limit of that is, but it, it seems like it's a, that, that's a, a sort of center to hold on where, you know, different projects and practices develop in different directions. So it sounded a lot like what, what for example, what Jaffer and Emmett, both of you are saying that the architect is in many ways almost like a film director where his job lies in coordinating experts around cer certain more specific um, equipments and techniques. But then the medium of expression is, for example, in film, it's, it's visual, it's audiovisual. And whereas in architecture, perhaps it's in uh, material, it's, it's in something more um, that has to do with our daily immediate physical reality um, that is Manipulate it actually as a as a given, right? Because I, I think architecture sort of assumes that there is a, a world that we occupy and that we can actually change, and that we can, you know, manipulate and make it ours. And so I think in so in that sort of coordination. So if we if we I think that that actually goes back to like the 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 last question I asked like whether you guys think a physical material is like the the core of architecture because maybe that's the wrong way of expressing that maybe the more correct way is to say that physical materials are more like the the medium, uh, but the the actual practice the actual actual exercise of architecture is is not necessarily that but it's more like the film director, but then what do you think is the goal then for, for in terms of coordination? Is it efficiency? Is it aesthetics? Is it functionality? Or is it more like it, it's a philosophy about how we live? What do you think is the driving or, or for, for your very personal work, like what is something that makes you feel like, okay, I've fulfilled an architect's duty in this particular case? It seems like all of those things. Uh, that those are all pieces of the puzzle. I mean, you have to have an idea of how something can be, I think a particular skill of architects. I mean, this is what I recognize more in my, in practice or in, um, you know, kind of just being in the world as somebody who's been kind of called an architect um, or trained in some fashion as an architect is that um, I think a particular skill of architects, I think architects, many of them spend a lot of time maybe not without even recognizing it, just observing the ways in which things are used and the ways in which people sort of move through the world. And I think a particular skill and one that's central to the way in which we work is to project um, possibilities in, in the use of uh, various forms, you know, various kind of material structures. And so, you know, when we sit and draw or design or model or whatever, you know, there's no actual function yet in the literal sense. Like nobody's actually using that thing yet, but we have a constant kind of um, projection running of how things might be used. And that's not, um, you know, there's, there's various degrees of uh, specificity that you can um, build into a project. You know, obviously say 
bathrooms will be used in more predictable ways probably than large open spaces with lots of natural light which but no fixtures whatsoever you know which which may lend themselves to a whole uh, host of other uses but you know you don't have any real control in the end over how people will use things but i think you have to have a kind of um ambition or uh, agenda for um guiding or tilting you know sp space a little bit more towards one kind of use or if not a kind of use maybe not a kind of use but a, a kind of quality that could um whatever the use is, uh, improve it or sustain it or um, allow it to be, um, you know, just even more enjoyable than it would in a less, uh, a less precisely designed space. Um, so I think there's always some kind of projection. I don't know if it's necessarily a kind of philosophy of, of life, but certainly some kind of projection of a possible life or a possible range of lives that could unfold in the space you design. At the same time, of course, you have to recognize that ultimately, as an architect, I mean, I'm talking about this with my students now because we're intervening in buildings which sit in New York and have been sitting in New York for a hundred something years and their architects are long dead. And, you know, it's a useful reminder to the students that if, if they were fortunate to build a large building in New York, it will probably last a lot longer than they will. And, and though they might have ambitions for that building to immediately kind of solve some kind of problem, that's ultimately not what that building is going to do. It's going to um, create a sort of framework of possible abilities and possible uses that's going to persist and be transformed in time outside of the control of, of the architect. And so there's some kind of balancing of both the desire to project particular lifestyles or particular activities or particular kind of possibilities and an acknowledgement of the fact that ultimately you have a certain agency in putting the actual materials of the, the structure together and you have to be sort of comfortable or you have to believe that the way in which you did that will persist in a in a way that's positive um, without being sort of determinative because you don't know and you can't know um, what actually will happen once that thing is out in the world. Um, in that sense, I think it's a little bit different than a film because a film is as a kind of narrative medium is much more direct and telling a kind of story and in, in its relationship with an audience is, you know, it speaks in a, in a very different way than a or a, a typical film, let's say, than a, a work of architecture does, which is a little bit more kind of in the background, and just a kind of obstinate thing, which is there, which people have to deal with and work around and, and live in and move through, but not necessarily um, receive a kind of narrative from or instruct, you know, be kind of instructed in how they should, they should go about their um, day. Jaffer, do you want to comment? Or can I give a comment. Jeffrey, you're on mute. I said you can give a comment. <laughs> okay, okay. I think it's because there's one one word that, well, there's one thing that um, Emma just mentioned that really sort of resonated with me is this idea about architecture as something so persistent and that lasts beyond our immediate intervention. Because I think, well, maybe this is coming from like my, my sort of personal struggle with the discipline as well is um how do you feel sort of entitled to do this <laughs> to 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 uh, sort of create to push forward these instructions because although i met you say that you know it's compared to a film um architecture is more muted it goes to the background it's less instructive but then you also said that it is a projection right it's a projection of possible re re envisions of how we can live, how we could use space that's coming from, you know, an individual or a set of individuals. And, and the lasts perhaps usually much longer than um, the lifespan of these individuals. So I think in, so in, on the other hand, architecture, uh, architecture is very instructive. It's very, it does speak in an even more um, obstinate and in a more sort of immutable way. Right, it, like for a film, you could choose to not watch it. Like it's it's bad, or you could, yeah. or it, and at most takes you two hours or three, 
and then you can choose to forget about it and maybe bash on it if it's not good. But then architecture, it really fundamentally changes the way that people engage with certain space that's on earth, that, that's, you know, that's not recyclable. That's <laughs> so like, how do you I do that? I have anxiety about this, so I, I don't know how you, how you figure out how to do it. It's very, it's... Do you have that struggle or is it just me? Like, how do you feel, feel like... No, I think that's a natural, I mean, at every level, I think from like, it, how long is this material really gonna last? Or is this thing, you know, is this, like even the most banal things, like, you know, is this like kitchen cabinet just gonna fall apart in six months? <laughs> You know, like, what, what, how do we know that any of this stuff is going to work um, to, you know, the much more kind of substantive questions of like, is this organization of a, a space or this kind of structure of a, a space one, which is it the right one? And how do you know it's the right one? And, and you're so, you know, necessarily you're in your fix in the time that you're working in something and, and you know that as soon as you finish it you'll have by you'll already be learning new things that will have made you reconsider what you did um so i think it, yeah there's a lot of the sort of anxiety or uh uncertainty in the process and it is a little bit of a, a kind of leap of faith always that what you're doing will will work in a in a uh tangent you know in a kind of immediate functional sense and also is is the right thing to have done given the possibilities and the constraints you know, is the right kind of arrangement of things um, in that moment. But I think it also depends on how you approach architecture. Like, I think the word entitlement is a great one because you also don't need to act like an entitled architect, right? Like, there's a sort of inheritance of the kind of, like, genius of the individual, the master, like, you know, this whole idea that our job as architects is to come up with things that we just insist on and you know the legacy of our of our you know our teachers and the people who came before us is basically like have a vision stick with the vision force everyone else to bend to your vision and i think that that's i mean obviously that's not unilateral across the profession or the field by any means but that's one version of architecture that i think is kind of cloaked in issues of entitlement but i think like you know the there's a there's a possibility of approaching architecture as a completely open and discursive and dialogic field where like you know, every project that we've ever done starts with a very open conversation, not just with the client, but with the contractors. Like, how would you do this? How can this be done better? What are like standards and practices? How can we like imagine the afterlife of the building? How can we minimize the kind of disruptions that this creates to the world that it sort of inserts itself in? And I think that that can lead to new types of formal typologies. Like it's not purely an ethical project. It can also be an aesthetic one as well. Mm -hmm. And like, of course you could tie this to a kind of critical regionalism. But I think that if you want to sort of bring like an idea of vision to a conversation to produce a hybrid that's completely unknowable from the outset, that's a, a way of treating architecture not as an act of an entitlement, but as an act of social relations, right? Which is like an act of like a network or like a, a condition, um, an environment. So like it, I, I don't know. And it might just be that like the way my office is structured is that it's led by two people who aren't necessarily like comfortable with the idea of, of vision or being like visionaries. But I think that like the way that we always test our architecture is like an openness at every degree of the process. Like, can it be open from the outset in terms of a conversation with other experts that actually lead us in new directions? Can it be open in terms of like a conversation with the client where like the idea of program is not something where like this has to act as X and this other thing has to act as Y, but everything kind of operates more fluidly and can be reappropriated and reused and kind of like, find like new ways of acting in situations. So it, I guess, becomes a sort of situational medium more than an absolute medium. Um, and then likewise, even with Afterlives, I mean, one of the, one of the projects that we've been like sort of excitedly half developing over the last couple of years had to do with like, we do a lot of exhibition design as a kind of like one leg of our practice. And we were going crazy over the fact that every time we designed a show, we would show up three months later and everything would be in the dumpster, right? So like we started collaborating with the Department of Sanitation to figure out how like everything that we use in exhibitions can go to like, you know, whatever, other programs, whatever that is. Like it can basically be reclaimed by the world. 
Um, and then the one thing that we couldn't figure out how to do is like what to do with drywall. So then we launched on this two year research project around drywall. And that became again, like an open conversational thing. How can we like minimize? And it, on the one hand, of course, there's a kind of ethics of environmentalism and sustainability and whatever. But for us, it had more to do with thinking about lives. And that's why I like that Emmett at the very beginning talked about how afterlives are essential to their practice, because that's exactly how we frame our work. Like, how can it, if architecture persists, how can we resist the idea that it has to persist in a singular fashion mm -hmm. and can actually experience like lots of different lives, like in its use, in its redeployment, in its kind of like destruction even. And I think that that, it, I don't know, I'm, I've never really thought about the, the word entitlement kind of governing those decisions, but I think that's like a really fascinating way of framing it. Like, what are we entitled to? What are we entitled to do? And who's entitled to have a kind of stake in the built environment? Like, I think it's problematic to assume that architects are the only ones who are able to be entitled in that way. And like, the more you fracture the singularity of entitlement, the less it becomes entitlement and the more it just becomes like the product of, uh, of, a, of a culture or a cultural moment. Anna, you're muted. This is also maybe why there's a bit of a generational return to the idea of architecture as a kind of open framework, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a much more fixed uh, form yeah. and an interest in slightly more generic or understated um, sort of diagrams than what I think we were largely educated to produce um, or were sort of uh, exposed to in our earlier careers um, exactly because of this question of, or, you know, this kind of maybe more modest attitude about how the architect can intervene to create a sort of framework of possibilities rather than um, fix a specific outcome. And I think that's, that's very much a, a sort of formal and aesthetic um, problem, not, not merely one of a sort of attitude towards practice, but it manifests itself in, in the actual forms of things. It, it sounds, what, what you guys just said reminds me a lot of performance art and especially situation art situational art um I, I i did personally like with um art also before architecture and it, i there's one word that i personally really like is roman ondax uh, good feelings in good times so it's a performance work that basically has people lining up in front of like a, at a specified place at a specified time and it's been re sort of performed a lot of times it's like I, at that time a couple of years ago it was like the only performance work that's like a, that became a permanent collection at um, Tate Modern, which mm. was also funny because they bought it. <laughs> but it's really just a set of instruction, like these people right. line up at this place. But it's, oh, but it's uh, largely about being open, right? I think that has to do a lot with like situational um, performance, situation work more so than performance. Performance still has a directionality to it. It's meant to, um, to express, there is a there is an object that there is someone speaking and someone being spoken to, where a situation is, you know, like I really like how how you two both framed it as a as an openness and a, an openness of a open framework of possibility where it really invites it's inviting the audience it's inviting the interlocutor to create to construct the 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 work rather than yeah. um, the performance. I think, yeah, and I think that performance art, and I claim no expertise in performance art whatsoever. Um, in fact, with the, the, the piece around drywall started with an invitation from Performa to us to like do a work and we're like, we are not, this is not our like vibe. I have no idea how to do it. But I do think that, that uh, performance art is a really interesting thing to look at because it is precisely built around the idea of the unexpected and the unpredictable and the unmanageable, right? Like the idea that like, you know, it, what you were saying reminds me a lot of like Tina Segal's work, you know, people who sell instructions as like ways for people to move around. And, you know, there's no way to dictate how that's going to go. It relies on so many unknowns. And I think that that's like a much more interesting way of approaching architecture than the quote unquote ideal user, 
which is like a legacy of the kind of like post-war, like late modernist sensibility that there's like an ideal person who, by the way, is probably going to be like heterosexual and white and like Western European in their orientation. And they're going to occupy space the correct way. They're going to use the garden the right way. They're going to use the paths the right way. They're going to use the square the right way. They're going to use the hallway in the, in the housing project the right way. And that, that degree of quote unquote prescriptive correctness is both deeply uh, problematic for a lot of obvious reasons, but also like fundamentally Im impossible and improbable to execute. So like the, the kind of looseness, openness and unpredictability of performance art, like this is the way in which like a kind of polyvalent subject might be accounted for in space versus like the, the singular subject. Well, Guys, I'm sorry, my uh, my environment is devolving into chaos. <laughs> so this is the best outcome. <laughs> in a few minutes, speaking of control. <laughs> oh, polyvalent subject. I think that, oh, that's super interesting. I'm currently in a course, actually, that talks about the subject, sub, uh, a philosophy course that talks about subject by object, and then the sort of the post-Kantian shift that basically resulted us being the sole subject of the world, being the sole, constitu so the sole constitution, like our minds became, um, the world became constitutive of like our minds. And then there's this host um, real relationship to the world that's very like post enlightenment, which I think personally is also very poisonous and perhaps it's still lingering on in our profession very much. That is becoming problematic but um actually going back to like what jaffer said like about these interests in like performance art and both of you actually work in other sort of media media right so you, you do a lot of writing and you do exhibition work and artworks that are you know you call those artworks and you call them exhibitions you don't call them architecture so what what do you guys think like how do you think about the relation of an architect and and also both of you have commented like architect not should not reach out to other expertise and like we, there's this inward sort of reflection on the core of architecture but then you still engage in these other non-architectural medium or like what do you think is the relationship between an architect and these other methods of expression um i will go because emmett is coming in and out of focus <laughs> Uh, I guess I will probably just repeat what I said earlier and, and say that I think the role, the relationship between the architect and the other modes of expression are we should engage in as many other modes of expression as possible and not, and not sort of claim them into architecture, but to actually just like reach out, listen, learn, and produce new things as a result of those conversations. It's a very simple answer. Produce new things. So, yeah. so you do see <laughs> as this enabler of potentially new things, and that is envisioning. That is very much new. Although I, yeah, I will. I appreciate. I appreciate the call out, but um, yeah, I think new is different than reinvented or expanded. Um, like I think in this case, it's like it's new can just be something that you haven't done before. And I think that that can be per personal and it can be specific and it can like have a very limited reach, but I think reinvention and expansion mm -hmm. deal, I mean, to your, I, I love that you're, you're interested in these issues of, of the kind of late enlightenment because it's like very much like a lot of work I'm doing now. But I, I think that like the idea of reinvention or expansion deal with the kind of like scientific positivism around objectivity where like you're entering into something in order to produce like, you know, the expansion assumes the ontology of a whole or a singular. Like new is kind of like dumb and friendly and unspecific, but I think that like in terms of, of semantics, it doesn't presuppose like an ontology that pre-exists, right? Hmm. Well, that's a very big claim to, <laughs> to <laughs> your premise on your work. Hmm. Wait, sorry, I forgot what I was saying, but like, Emmett, do you want to comment? Uh, maybe just to say, I don't know that I would call things we do that aren't like designs for buildings artworks. 
I think there's still a different, you know, I think maybe insofar as architecture is a, could be seen as an art medium, they exist within that. But I, I think we are very conscious of not playing the part of artists in this kind of dilettante way, but instead thinking about each thing we do as contributing to something that I, I think we would define fairly conventionally in a way as an architectural practice and not, you know, we're not looking for other forms of expression as a means of avoiding or kind of moving orthogonally to the problem of building, but rather using those things as opportunities to test things that we're interested in uh, ultimately trying to build, if that makes sense. Okay. Oh, now I remember what I was wanting to say, because also in response to what both of you said about this, um, this very modest attitude with architecture, which I actually found very refreshing and very encouraging, and it almost rosies up the picture of the field for me a little bit. <laughs> and, but, I, but I do want to say that um, I feel like architecture as a medium has an innate publicity to it. It's public. It's way more public than other forms of art. And in that, almost inevitably, it comes with a lot of baggage and responsibility. Um, and so that's why I think that that also echoes back to the idea of entitlement or like to my question earlier, like where do you see as an effective boundary of your work? Because it isn't, and although that we say like artworks can be very personal, right? An exhibition, the temporal work can be very personal and it can be very open, but architecture is essentially, it's way larger than the person. What you produce is in, in the end, right? It, it has a, this, this publicness to it that con that results in a lot more impact to other people than a piece of artwork or a film. So I, I don't know how like whether that has worked itself into like how you see wh what what you see as unique to architecture and its responsibility as well as duty and um, value. Guys, yeah, I'm I mean, sorry. I have to sign off. I have to I have to give up give up the office space to the, the next user. Okay, thank, you so um, much <laughs> but thank you for having me. And I hope there was something helpful in what I said. No, it nice was to see so everyone so. virtually. Yeah, thank you. I, I, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, I'll be, I mean, we cannot, we obviously should wrap up if we lost yeah. Emmett, but um, yeah, I, I it's a difficult thing to talk about because I would never use this as a way of judging or evaluating any other architect. So I, this is like deeply personal and it's not a way that I would want to like weaponize moral judgment to attack anyone um, else. But I agree with you basically philosophically. Like I don't know that that needs to be projected as a kind of like position, but I feel a ton of responsibility for how architecture is produced. I mean, I think we work um, in designing, like we're the biggest contributors to, you know, problems of the environment probably than any other creative <laughs> field. Um, there's labor that's caught up in what we do. There's uh, capitalism, like, yeah. you know, architecture is an art, but it's also more of a service profession than any other quote unquote art form. Um, so we're client driven. We have to do what our clients want. A lot of our clients have money that's, you know, probably not ethically, you know, generated. <laughs> like I, I found it, you know, when all of the thing, all of the kind of narrative was going down around Warren Candors at the Whitney, I don't know if you all remember this, but um, this is one of the members of their board of trustees who was basically had this company called Safari Land that makes uh, tear gas that was used in wars around the world. And I remember everyone was so angry about this person. There were protests, artists withdrawing from the Whitney Biennial, all of which, of course, I support. I don't support the guy who's making tear gas. But also, I was kind of scratching my head the whole time being like, well, in our world in architecture, I assume that anyone who's paying me has money that's probably tainted in one regard or the other, because all money is tainted in one regard or the other. And like all of capitalism is a horrible, oppressive construct. And, you know, we can't be like true 
Marxists and work as young architects in the United States in a way that like actually does anything. So it's a field that's full of these kind of like problematic political and, and social concessions. And I think that the best we can do is to, to kind of come up with terms of evaluating our own work where we say like, you know, at best I can think about public space that accommodates like all these different kinds of bodies and subjectivities. At best I can think about buildings that can be disassembled or focus my practice on reuse or focus on engaging the city or whatever it is. Like I'm, I'm basically saying the things that my practice does because these are the ways that I construct mm -hmm. my kind of ethical universe. Um, but I do that because precisely uh, I, you know, I want to do the best that I can because I think architecture has a, a very serious social responsibility because of its publicness, because of its wastefulness, because of its size, because of its impact. I mean, that's the thing. It's like its impact extends in all directions. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, like from labor to materiality, to publicness, to use, to, to financing and all of these things. Um, so the best that any of us can do is basically try and work with clients that we believe in, try and take on projects that feel like they're not ethically compromised, try and do the best with like the kind of programs that we're given. And to me, that's like a kind of worthwhile endeavor um, for now. I mean, maybe, you know, I, I for years I've been saying, you know, like it. It, it hurts like every exhibition design project. And I use those as, a, as an example because those are the ones that we do that have the shortest lifespan. You know, like our residential projects or commercial projects, like those might have like a five, 10, 20, 50 year lifespan. Yeah. But the exhibition design ones are three months and they cost millions of dollars and they are trashed as soon as they're over. And um, all our collaborations with the Department of Sanitation started with a deep anxiety about those issues. So it makes me super happy that this is something that you all are considering. And it's a big reason that I agreed to do this as well, you know, is that I think well, like I, I want to believe in what you believe in and I want you to kind of keep going with it. And, um, and I think it matters, but as individuals, we have to decide what matters. And hopefully you're of a generation where you make those decisions and then you adhere to them and you don't immediately get usurped by the desire for expansion and reinvention and bigness and the things that I think are, are kind of um, red herrings in the, in our field, you know, vision, like singular genius, like these, these aren't ways I think that we're going to tackle some of the problems of architecture's agency. Thank you so much. That's thank you, yeah. to hear. Thank you. Jeff. Very heartwarming too. Yeah. Very positive. <laughs> that was a very positive statement that you just made. <laughs> you, you, you can do it. <laughs> it just takes a little bit of Saturday morning therapy to get me, uh, you know, back onto this onto the positive side. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a very therapeutic session for me personally. Actually, having a yeah. lot of a crisis. Very involved. positive. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much. Hope you, you enjoy you at so and thank you for joining us on a saturday morning and that was yeah i think that was a great conversation i think we yeah it was much greater than the points i prepared for <laughs> i really liked how no, it, was a, it was a first off um again sorry i was a few minutes late and a little bit frazzled at the beginning um but thank you all for the invitation i mean it's a really exciting project you're doing i'm you know it's so good that you are taking time to do it not this conversation not anything to do with us but this whole competition like i know that's a lot of extra work for three students <laughs> who are all in <laughs> very challenging programs. And I know at least one of you personally is a very hard worker and I'm sure all of you are. And I, I don't know, I, I wanna emphasize both my gratitude for including us in this, but also just good work in doing it and keep it up and keep struggling, keep having anxieties around the field because that makes us all better. Great, I believe in that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good day. Yeah, yeah. Then, thank you. Yeah, thank right, you. Bye. Right. Thank you, everyone. So, Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Yes, and we're gonna have, uh, <laughs> we're one. gonna have again the video and the transcription up on the website, and our Instagram will update uh, clips of highlights from this conversation and also from like our previous conversations. Our next one will come in about two weeks.
two three weeks and we're we're looking at inviting some um so some friends from gsd so we have a professor Dario from a uh, harvard uh, graduate school of design and we're looking to invite so it'll be basically uh, professors um, beyond our like immediate jury panel to basically all help us and to all help us in our struggles as designers to help us think and to inspire um, our conversation and our sort of careers and life in general. So thanks everyone. So follow us on Instagram for the for dates and uh, for the clips and for updates regarding our next chat. So, All right. Uh, go. Good night. Everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.